here at CES, and there's a lot of extraordinary technology. You know, walking around, there is countless going on in, in drones and robotics and AI, AR and VR. Uh, I would guess my first question here is, is for what technology are you most excited about right now? So this CES is different from most of the ones that are going on because we actually see a technology that's finally becoming commercial uh, in a way that it hasn't been, you know, in the average year. And that's virtual reality or augmented reality uh, in, in the different things. We've got the, you know, the Oculus Rift, the HTC Vive, we've got uh, Microsoft HoloLens, which is, uh, and we've got things like the Mac, the Ultimate. And for me, these are all really interesting things, uh, as is sort of the thing that we're using right now, the, the theme telephone robot. Because for most people, when we think about connectivity, when we think about a Google uh, Hangouts chat or a Skype call, uh, they don't really think about the security of these things very much. They don't uh, really concern themselves with it because they don't feel vulnerable. They don't feel that that would be abusable. But increasingly, we're seeing that these things are being exploited in ways. Uh, and it's it's not all for bad purposes. Some of them are for legitimate uses. You know, we want there to be some uh, platforms for targeted surveillance, for example, terrorism, for investigating serious crimes, uh, or monitoring the movements of you know nuclear forces and uh, you know adversary armies and things like that. These are understood, but the progress of surveillance technology the pervasiveness of it uh, has enabled what's called indiscriminate surveillance, which the government likes to describe by using And this means rather than going about surveillance in the traditional way, uh, where you go after the end, right? You target the person making the phone call, you target the person writing the email. Uh, instead, they target the means of transmission, the background that we're all using. Uh, and that means they're not just seeing uh, what bad people or criminals are, are doing. They're seeing what everyone's doing, and they're collecting it. Uh, this is actually a described mission statement from classified documents. So they collect it all. Uh, because the idea is, if they do this, they can create a kind of surveillance time machine, where you're not doing anything wrong. They have no reason to be watching you. Uh, there's no individualized suspicion of wrong going for your activities. But they go, well, you might become a in three years or five years of change. So if we simply create, collect records of everyone, whether they're the content of your call for stuff, which is not under the circumstances, or the metadata of the activity records of where you're at, uh, who you called, when you called them, how long, or everyone, what they can do is they can create perfect records of private records at scale for everyone. And so this creates a sort of choke points in the way we relate with each other, uh, the way we interact with each other, but it changes. Because when people are being watched, their behavior changes. It shifts in, in new ways. People get nervous uh, when they're around cameras. And you, see, you see TV cameras coming up all the time. Uh, and increasingly, things like the cell phone in your pocket, uh, the payment system you use, uh, the record of where you got a taxi from, when you ordered it from Uber or Lyft, or so on and so forth. These things are being created and generated, and eventually these will be exploited in new ways. Now, virtual reality and augmented reality are interesting, as is sort of what we're doing now, because you can project presence across geographical space without actually leaving any record of travel. Uh, you can have truly private experiences, private conversations. Like, what, like we're doing now. Right now, the technology is not quite there. But this is the first step. People talk about virtual reality in the context of playing games. But think about it in terms of a remote office. What if you could commute to work without having to sit in traffic? You know, what if you got tired of the augmented reality, for example, uh, looking out your window at sort of the gritty apartment building next door to you, uh, and could instead see the beach? Uh, and you know, wherever you look, wherever you gaze, you see the best quality experience. Uh, what if you could sit down for you know, a Thanksgiving dinner, a Christmas party, a New Year's Eve party, uh, with all of your friends, the people that you care the most about, even though you're far away because you're on business travel, uh, even though because you're in the hospital or you have limited mobility, 
I have uh, someone who's very close to me who's the victim of a serious car accident. Because of that, they can't travel uh, anymore in different ways. But they love to travel. And when we think about what these technologies are providing, they're providing mobility, they're providing capability, they're providing reach. And this is something that previously has always existed with cyber at a uh, significant commercial cost in terms of actual uh, sort of transportation, which can actually make it a luxury good if you need to have quick reaction traffic. Uh, and, and I'm going to be really expensive. I'm going to jump in here but a second. What's happening is technology is allowing us to defeat the tyranny of this. And for me, that's a very exciting thing. That's really the story of this video. So I want to take the conversation. So I study exponential technologies uh, at Singular University. I write, I teach, I build companies around it. And one of the questions I have, one of the beliefs I have, is that as we're in this extraordinary, accelerating future that's coming at us, that I wonder whether privacy actually will become an outdated concept. And I want to have this conversation with you a little bit. Not a matter of, I love my privacy, not a matter of, you know, do I want to retain my privacy? But the question is, as we're heading forward, let me give you some examples, right? One of the companies um, I co-founded, Human Longevity, is the world's largest genome sequencing facility. And all of us might think our health records are our most private part around us. But I can come up and shake your hand, well, actually not your hand, but shake someone's hand here, grab a couple of skin cells, sequence you, unbeknownst to you, and have your entire health history. Uh, here at the show, we're, you know, one of the big things is Internet of Things. You know, IoT, we're at some 15 to 20 billion connected devices. By 2020, we'll be at 50 to 100 billion connected devices. Each of those connected devices with a dozen sensors on them. And so we're heading towards a world of what I call a trillion sensor economy, where everything is being seen, everything is being watched, everything is being measured, everything is being sensed. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there's satellites watching manufacturing plants in China, raw materials coming in, finished products going out. There are drones, micro drones, autonomous cars with LIDARs imaging everything around. And I imagine a future in which it's really going to be, privacy is going to become so hard to maintain that we might actually start to see a cultural shift. And I'll, I'll make one other quick point, which is I'm a father of two four and a half year old boys. And I realize that I have to teach them that anything they do that's captured on social media is going to be there forever. And so I think that's going to change how they will behave. And it makes me think about does radical transparency, which is I think where we're heading towards, actually change norms and mores and morality? Because most evil doing is done in the dark, right? A dictator in a country oppression, women and children, a drug deal in the back alley. But if everything's being watched all the time, I'm not saying by the state, but by tech, by all of this tech. So I, I think, what do you think about that? Right. So this is this is a really complex issue space, and uh, I think even if we dedicated all the time that left this uh, here, we wouldn't be able to go. Uh, at it completely. But what I can tell you briefly is that a lot of it depends. Uh, this is a very nuanced space. And some of the things that you say are presumptions, which are not always uh, not always accurate. For example, uh, the idea that wrongdoing is always done in the dark, uh, it's not always true. Uh, it's done in the dark when that person built it. That presumes that there's accountability to be dodged. For example, you use the example that uh, dictators, you know, are going to cause some problem uh, when nobody knows about it. Somebody's going to get disappeared, they're going to be snatched off the street. 